Good evening. Welcome to Holbrook's Evangelical Church. My name is John Bass and I'm one of the pastors here. And it's a real joy to be able to welcome you to our online service here tonight. Perhaps you're here for the very, very first time and maybe you've been tuning in over the past few weeks. And if that's you, if you are here for the first time or if you're a visitor with us, then we'd love to get to know you. We'd love to hear from you. And at the end of our service, there's going to be a phone number and an email address that you're able to use to get in touch with us. Maybe you've got some questions about uh, some of the things that you've heard maybe tonight or over the past few weeks. Or maybe you'd just like to know uh, a little bit more about the Christian faith. Well, do get in touch with us uh, by either calling us or, or using that email address and we'll get back to you and we'll seek to help answer some of those questions for you. Tonight we're going to be uh, continuing our series looking uh, at the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, and tonight we've actually arrived at 1 Samuel chapter 23. And a little bit later on, Chris Hill is going to be opening up God's word to us from that chapter. But before we get there, before we do that, we're going to be joining together in song. There's going to be two songs and the words will come up on the screen. If you want to join in, then join in and, and sing along. But if you want to just listen... Uh, that's fine as well. We're also going to be reading the passage together that we've just spoken about and we're going to be coming to, to, to prayer as well. Uh, it's good isn't it to be able to pray together at this time as we come to God to give him praise and adoration but also to bring our prayers and petitions before him. So my prayer is that as we gather in our own homes tonight, as we read, as we sing and as we hear from God's words, that God would really meet with us uh, would bless us and encourage us uh, during this time. Before we begin and before we sing together, I just want to read a few words from Psalm 46. It's a, a psalm really of great comfort, uh, perhaps especially at this time. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Well, in a moment we're going to sing, but before we do, let's come to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. This time that we can come together in this unusual way as we're together online. But we do pray that as we sing and as we pray and as we read your word and hear from your word, that you would indeed presence yourself with us, that you would use this time to speak to us and encourage us and challenge us, that you'd be with Chris as he opens up your word and for us as we listen, that you might really speak to us tonight from your word. Show us ourselves, Father, but show us our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we do pray that you would continue with us, prepare our hearts to receive your word tonight. For we bring all these things before you in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, no, he counts 
Lord, their song flowing to a sea without bottom or shore. As sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. chapter 23 and we're going to begin at verse 1 then they told David saying look the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and they are robbing their threshing floors therefore David inquired of the Lord saying shall I go and attack these Philistines and the Lord said to David Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah. For I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahalimelech, fled to David at Keilah, 
that he went down with an ephod in his hand. And Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Then Saul called all the people together for war, to go down to Keilah, to besiege David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul. And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah. So he halted the expedition. And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of, my, of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David stayed in the woods and Jonathan went to his own house. Then the Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in strongholds in the woods in the hill of Hikalah? which is on the south of Jeshimon. Now, therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down. And our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hands. And Saul said, blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. Please go and find out for sure and see the place where his hideout is. And who has seen him there? For I am told that he is very crafty. See, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with certainty and I will go with you. And it shall be, if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. So they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David, Therefore, 
he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maun. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maun. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore, Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they called that place the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. Amen. This is God's word. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. is 
complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you and praise you for who you are. And we thank you that as we come before you tonight, we know that you are sovereign and ruling and reigning over all. Father, we do thank you for your amazing love to us. Father, we Thank you that this love has been lavished upon us, though we didn't deserve it. You chose to set your heart upon us. And we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you that because of your great love, you sent the Lord Jesus Christ into this world to live the life that we could never have lived to die the death that we deserve to die and to pay the price that we couldn't pay. Father, we pray as we come tonight to hear your word and to, to meet together in this way, as we seek to live our lives in the weeks and months and years ahead, Father, we do pray that you would give us a fresh sense of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Father, may we keep our eyes fixed upon him, the author and the perfecter of our faith, knowing that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. So, Father, we do pray tonight as we come now to hear your word preached to us that you would indeed prepare our hearts and our minds in this moment. Father, we do think of this current situation that we are facing. Father, although we are in the midst of much confusion and there's still a lot of uncertainty about what it is ahead for the immediate future and beyond. Father, we can rest and be sure that although we do not know what the future holds, that we can take confidence that you do. We do thank you for our amazing NHS staff, uh, the frontline workers, the carers, all of those who are uh, continuing to keep services running and functioning so that we can be looked after and cared for and have some kind of um, normality to life uh, in our basic needs. And we do thank you for their willingness to to put themselves on the front line, to, to go out every day and to work so that we can get what we need and have what we need. For our daily lives. Father, we do we do commit all of them to you, Father, and we pray that you'd protect them, that you'd keep them safe from this virus, and Father, that you would continue to strengthen them as no doubt they're facing busier times. We just pray that they would know a strength from above that sustains them through this time. We do lift up to our government and we do thank you for them. We thank you that uh, you have put them in authority over us. And Father, we do pray again for their protection, but we also pray, Father, for um, for their their guidance, I guess, as, as they lead us through this difficult time. Father, as I think about it, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be in their position. But I do pray, Father, that you would give them wisdom from above 
that you would lead and guide them as they seek to navigate us and protect us in this difficult time. But Father, we do pray as as we, we pray every week that for our government and for people up and down this land and across our world, Father, we pray that during this time that you would help each one of us to see and be reminded of the fragility of life and therefore the certainty of death for each one of us and therefore to recognise our need of a saviour. May you draw men and women and, and young people to a saving knowledge of yourself. Father, during this time, as we know that you work all things for good, we, we do pray that during this difficult time that you would bring people to yourself. Open up hearts, we pray. But Father, we also recognise that as we come, as we gather online tonight, we recognise that there will be some amongst us who are suffering, who are unwell. Some, Father, who are mourning the loss of loved ones. And Father, we do pray that you would be all that they need in this time. Father, you would bring comfort to those who need comforting. You would bring healing, for, if, it, if it be your will, you'd bring healing to those who need healing. And that you'd bring strength to those who need strengthening. Father, for those who are isolating, on their own, vulnerable, for those who are struggling with their mental health. These are difficult times, these are unusual times. But we do pray that you would meet each one of us where we're at. And Father, we also know that, again, for each of us uh, as Christians here tonight, that, uh, that upon each of our hearts, there are friends and family and loved ones who we are crying out to from the depths of our heart, that you might save them and open up their hearts. And so we do lift each and every one of them to you uh, this evening. Father, we do lift up to you uh, our local businesses and those in our community. Father, for businesses and for families and for individuals across this community, there will be many people that are perhaps struggling financially. And Father, we do pray again. We know you are the God who provides. And we do again pray that you would meet our needs, that you would sustain each and every one. Uh, Lord, this is a time where financial things can cause us great anxiety. But again, Father, we know that you have everything in, in your hands and you are in control. Uh, and we do pray that you help us to trust that, to trust you for our daily lives. And so, Father, we... We do now pray for ourselves as we're gathered here tonight. Be with us and meet with us, we pray. And as we now come to consider your word together, we do pray that as Chris speaks and opens up this passage to us, that we might see something fresh from your word tonight. Lord, show us ourselves, but Father, above all, we pray that you would show us our Saviour, show us the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might see a fresh sense of him and all that he has done for us and all that he continues to do for us as we continue to live for him, to, to live lives that are worthy of the calling that you have given to us. So, Father, we do pray as we bring all of our prayers and petitions before you, as we pray for all of the churches up and down this land, maybe even in this moment, who are opening up your word, who are preaching the good news of the gospel, we pray that you would strengthen each one of those ministers and speak to those who are listening. And for all of us, that we would be ready to hear and respond to your word tonight. 
So, Father, we pray now that you'd be with us and draw alongside each other, each one of us. Meet with us, we pray. For we ask all these things in your precious and holy name, the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good evening to you. Um, I wonder whether you're like me and you have things that go round and round in your head and you're never quite sure how they get there or how to get rid of them. And normally for me, it's a, it's a bit of a song, a bit of music that I don't know the start of and I don't know the end to, so it just keeps going round and round in my head. And while I was looking at 1 Samuel 23, I had something that was actually really useful going round in my head. A couple of months ago, the kids at Sunday school were learning uh, a couple of verses of Proverbs chapter 3. And they're verses 5 and 6, and they say this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And 1 Samuel 22 was called the tale of two kings. I think 1 Samuel 23 is a tale of two paths. We see a path that has rejected the Lord and one that is under the authority of the Lord. So if you were in any doubt about how desperate Saul was to kill David, remember chapter 22. The question is, what had David done? David's life was wrapped up with Saul's. David was heroic in battle. He was best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. He was married to his daughter, and he was absolutely loyal to the king. But Saul stopped at nothing to kill David. If chapter 22 sees Saul at his worst, at the very depths of his behavior, chapter 23 probably shows us David at his best. David's behaviour in this chapter can be encapsulated by a verse of a psalm, Psalm 27. And this is what David says uh, to God. When you, that's God, says, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. So if that's David's behaviour, Saul's behaviour can be explained by, by this. Psalm 54, verse 3. David talking about the situation he's in in this chapter. And he says, violent men intend to kill me. They do not let God guide them. So there are four scenes in chapter 23. We're going to break it down into four scenes, pull out some observations from those scenes and wrap it all, hopefully, at the end. So the first scene, David says, verse 1 to 6 of chapter 23, and it says this, Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, and they are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Look, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord once again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now it happened when Abiathar the son of Ahimelech fled to David at Keilah, that he went down with an ephod in his hand. So we're not entirely sure where David is at the beginning of chapter 23, but we're pretty sure that he's in Judah's hill country and not too far away from Keilah. And his sources tell him the Philistines are raiding the harvested and threshed grain. That means the grain he's ready to use of the citizens of Keilah. And David's reaction, he's not hasty. He wants to do something to help. First things first, he inquires of the Lord whether he should attack or not. And the Lord tells him to go and attack the Philistines. David's men don't like the idea at all. Bear in mind, he only has 400 men at this point, And in chapter 22, they're described as desperate, discontented, and those in debt. 
They're hardly a crack team of soldiers. They're scared enough of having Saul as an enemy, let alone the Philistines. So David inquires of the Lord again. The Lord answers again, more emphatically, arise, go down. The Philistines will be delivered to them. No question this time, they go and deal the Philistines a mighty blow. The inhabitants of Keilah are saved. Things are looking up. This is a great victory for David and his men in the city of Keilah. The Lord is clearly with David and his ragtag army. Keilah's inhabitants and the precious harvest have been saved. The Philistines have brought livestock along to carry the harvest off. They would have been destitute without David. And verse 6, the remnant of the priesthood join David. The ephod contained the Urim and Thummim, which was the way the priests communicated with God, or God communicated with the priests. Uh, it tended to be, um, you ask a question, you get a, a yes or no answer. And this verse symbolises God's presence with David. Saul doesn't have access to God anymore. In fact, he's railed against God so much, he wants to wipe out the priesthood. And so Abiathar is the only priest left in all of Israel and Judah. So there are two reactions in the first scene, two reactions to the Keilah crisis. Firstly, where's Saul when Keilah need him? He's got the army, he's got the resources, to come to the aid of Keilah, but we hear nothing from him. When Keilah are being attacked by the Philistines, there's silence from Saul. We know from previous chapters that Saul is a coward, and he's too caught up in his own interests to care for the people he is supposed to be ruling over. Contrast that with David. David fights for Keilah. He deals a mighty blow to the Philistines with just 400 men. It's an incredible display of the Lord being with him. This must have been a huge affirmation to David and his men. Also, a clear sign to the people of Keilah. And the final verse of scene one is a further confirmation that Ephod, the only remaining priest, is now with David. We move to scene two, verse seven to 13. Saul and Keilah's reaction. So verse 7 to 13, and Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. Then Saul called all the people together for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. And da then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. So David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. Then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, so he halted the expedition. So Saul thinks that God has given David into his hand. David are in a town with barred gates. David is like a, a rat in a hole. He calls all available troops, that's all, and they get prepared to besiege Keilah and finish David off. What about calling the troops when Keilah was in need and the Philistines were against them? David finds out Saul is plotting to kill him again and he speaks to the Lord. He calls Abiathar, the ephod is brought to him. David prays and notice how he prays. He calls himself a servant in verse 10 and 11. O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks. And at the end, will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. The humility of David is on show here. 
His first question is to confirm the news he has received from his informants. Saul's coming and he's bringing his army and he wants to kill you. That's for sure. The second question confirms what the people of Keilah will do to David. The Lord confirms that David and his men will be given over to Saul and David and his men make their escape on this information. Now there's a small positive to all this negativity for David. There are now 600 men in his army. He's had an increase. So scene two, we see two rejections. We see clearly Saul's rejection of God in this passage. Saul should be rejoicing in the Lord's deliverance through David of Keilah. Instead, he says of David, God has delivered him into my hands. He doesn't ask God. It's just a statement to suit his own ends. The word translated deliver means to acknowledge, to respect, to care for. You see what Saul is saying here? God is acknowledging my cause. Saul doesn't acknowledge God. He says God is acknowledging him. He doesn't use the personal name of God as David does. He doesn't ask the Lord for guidance. It is God has delivered. Before coronavirus, uh, when I was driving to work and back, I used to listen to quite a few audio books. And one of the audio books I listened to relatively recently was a fantastic biography on Hitler by a guy called Ian Kershaw. And um, this particular passage of chapter 23 reminds me of an instance in uh, this biography that uh, Ian Kershaw tells us about. And the particular incident happened on July the 20th, 1944. Um, Hitler is inside his wolf's lair uh, in his conference room and a bomb is detonated. It's designed to kill Hitler. What someone, well, more than one person wanted to kill Hitler. Um, four people died. The conference room was destroyed, but Hitler survived. Uh, a big conference room table leg took the brunt of the impact and Hitler survived. He was mildly injured, um, but he managed to carry on. In fact, so much so that he carried on and had a meeting in the afternoon with Mussolini. And this is what Hitler said of his survival. I regard this as a confirmation of the task imposed upon me by providence and that nothing is going to happen to me. The great cause which I serve will be brought through this, its present perils and everything can be brought to a good end. Now remember in 1944 the war was as good as lost. Everyone around Hitler I think knew that at this point. And yet Hitler saw this particular incident as a sign of victory. Saul sees David's predicament as a, as a sign of a victory. It's actually confirmation of God's rejection. See, Saul's gathering his army not against the Philistines, the Edomites, the Amalekites, the Moabites, all known enemies of Israel, but against David. And then the second rejection. The people of Keilah's rejection of David. Why? Without him they would be destitute. No harvest was a huge deal. What would they eat during the cold winter months? And the display of the Lord being with David must have been obvious. The 400 men um, dealing a mighty blow to the Philistines. But the people of Judah have done this before. In Judges chapter 15 they sent 3,000 men to capture Samson and give him over to the Philistines. Now, Keilah are probably fearful of Saul. The Philistines have been removed and David's now the problem. And it's a reaction probably based on the destruction they would have no doubt heard about from chapter 23, uh, chapter 22, when um, Doeg the Edomite uh, kills 85 priests and then uh, goes into the city and destroys men, women, um, children and um, cattle. So Keilah reject David, their own tribesmen, to save their own skin. 
They're not prepared to throw their lot in with David, and they just want to get back to normal. Now notice another thing. Keilah haven't actually made this decision. This is a display of God's omniscience. God knows everything. God knows their hearts. He knows that they will reject David. So we move on to scene three, David's final meeting with Jonathan, Jonathan verse 14 to 18. And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains and the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows this. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his own house. So David is being hunted in Judah's hill country, but is being preserved from certain death by God. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. Saul was obviously very close to David, but for God's preservation, he would have certainly found him. David and his men must have been exhausted, hounded by Saul and his troops, hiding in wilderness, strongholds and mountains with seemingly no respite. His best friend, Jonathan, goes to David and strengthened his hand in God. If David had doubts about what would finally come about, Jonathan must have assured him, Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel. They re renew the covenant they had made before and then Jonathan leaves. Jonathan's timing was perfect for David and his men. They must have been reeling from the rejection. The Lord had confirmed to David of the people of Keilah, fearful for their lives, Saul and his army breathing down their necks in the wilderness. How humble was Jonathan? Verse 17, you shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. And Jonathan's so unlike his father, he recognises and accepts what God has said will happen, despite the fact that it means he'll never be king. And it's also sad, a spoiler alert to what's going to happen later on in 1 Samuel, that he never becomes David's right-hand man, and he dies in battle in chapter 31. And it's just a, a what-could-have-been um, situation, what a man Jonathan was, and how... Uh, useful um, and helpful it could have been for David. So two things flow from scene three. Firstly, we see the Lord's protection. Um, there's a hymn, Sovereign Ruler of the Skies, that sums this situation up. Not a single shaft can hit till the God of love sees fit. The Lord is in control. Saul and his army are a stone's throw away, but they've got no chance of finding David and his men. Now David would have had the needs of his men to think about as well as keeping away from Saul. I mean, hostile situation, uncomfortable, lonely, scary. And God sends Jonathan. Now no, Saul can't find Jonathan. Uh, Saul can't find David, sorry. But God sends Jonathan straight to him. Uh, it's, it's there as an encouragement. Jonathan doesn't pat him on the back and go, Chin up, it'll all work out. Jonathan's got experience. In 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan goes and attacks a Philistine garrison with just his armour bearer. And in verse 6 of chapter 14, he says, For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Jonathan knows what trusting in the Lord looks like. He strengthened David's hand in God. <clears throat> he spoke. God's truth to him. Proverbs 17 verse 17 says this, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Now you see, in, particularly in this section, the word hand is a, an indicator of power 
or strength. In verse 7, Saul declares God has put David into his hand when he's in Keilah. God here is preventing David from falling into Saul's hand. Jonathan strengthens David's hand in God. David's strength and power is not his own. It's from God. This is a reminder from Jonathan to David to keep relying on an all-powerful God. What an amazing friend and what amazing timing. And then we move to scene four. David pursued, verses 19 to 29. It says this, Then the Ziphites came up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding with us in strongholds, in the woods, in the hill of Hakila, which is in the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. And Saul said, Blessed are you of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. Please go and find out for sure and see the place where his hideout is, and who has seen him there, for I am told he's very crafty. See therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with certainty, and I will go with you. And it shall be, if he is in the land, that I will search for him throughout all the clans of Judah. So they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. When Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David. Therefore he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David and went against the Philistines. So they called the place the Rock of Escape. Then David went up from there and dwelt in the strongholds of En Gedi. So scene four, David pursued. The Ziphites attempt to cash in on this situation by telling Saul where David is. Not only that, they'll hand him over to Saul. They're going to go one better than Keilah. They've no doubt heard about the priestly city of Nob, the situation in Keilah. They, they don't want to get caught up in it all and decide the best method would be to hand him over to Saul and just get rid of him. Now note the response from Saul. He sees himself as a victim. May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. You see what Saul's doing here? He's invoking a blessing from the Lord against the Lord's anointed. And he sees God as acknowledging him again. In Saul's eyes, finally, some people are helping him catch David. The intelligence is really good this time. It's very detailed. In verse 22, Saul says that David is very crafty. And the word behind crafty is tree. Whenever Saul pursues David, he seems to melt into the surroundings. And Saul makes sure, verse 23, come back to me with certainty and I will go with you. This time, David is not getting away. In fact, Saul says he will search for him through all the clans or thousands of Judah. David finds out, moves to the wilderness of Maon. David, Saul is hot on his heels and pursues him there. See, Saul can now see David, he can almost smell David. Saul's troops execute a pincer movement and it's a scramble for David and his men to get away. They're being encircled. There's massive tension in verse 26. Saul has pretty much got him now. And then, verse 27, incredibly, a messenger arrives for Saul to say that the Philistines have invaded the land. The real enemy has taken advantage of Saul's pursuit of David um, to invade. And now Saul and his army turn to fight the true enemies of Israel. The Philistines, who start the chapter, being the enemies that David and his men defeat, 
now save David from Saul. So two things to look at from scene four, betrayal and blessing. The Ziphites, the opportunistic, uh, the opportunistic behavior against a fellow countryman, David, perhaps they wanted to look good um, in front of Saul or just wanted David out of the way so they could carry on with their lives. He's too much of a hot potato. They don't want to deal with it. They're comfortable as they are. David wrote Psalm 54 at this specific time. And he says this, For strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. See, the Ziphites are acting like Gentiles. They're, they're strangers to David. They're acting for their own ends. And then the blessing from Saul, this worthless blessing, must have sounded good if you're a Ziphite. The king blessing them in the name of the Lord. They're helping the king against his enemy. It's all become terribly twisted. I mean, Saul has demonstrated he's no help to his people. Look at Keilah. He's a destroyer of innocent life, killing the priests and all in their city. And he's trying to kill the Lord's anointed. It's all for his own ends. He's only blessing the Ziphites because he thinks things are going his way. Psalm 54 goes on and says this, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. The second thing we see is the enemy saves David. The messenger comes at the perfect time, just at the point when Saul is encircling David and his men. Saul's army are charging off in the other direction to fight the Philistines. And it's real, really darkly humorous that uh, Saul is suddenly taken away by the very people he wouldn't fight at the start of the chapter. And the Philistines save David um, now rather than being defeated by him and it's a, an amazing way of escape from Saul the place where it happened is called the rock of escape or the rock of separation or division God's timing is perfect let's remind ourselves of that proverb Proverbs 3 verse 5 and 6 trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths so the two paths Saul his path the rejected king who's rejected the Lord David the anointed king who trusts in the Lord see Saul is still king at this point he's got the army he's got the resources He's got the loyalty of the vast majority of the people, bar the 600 men with David. He's in charge. His hand is powerful. But he's not in control. He's desperate. He's cruel. He's misguided. And ultimately, he comes away empty-handed. David, in comparison, is nothing to Saul. He hasn't even got a home. He's hiding in the hill country of Judah. He's been rejected by his own people. He's been chased relentlessly by Saul and his army. And all he's got with him are 600 dysfunctional blokes following him because they've got nowhere else to go. Yet David trusts in the Lord. He acknowledges him throughout this passage and it's clear that his path is being directed by God. He's got Gad, the prophet. We see that uh, from chapter 22. He has the remaining priest, Abiathar, and he has a faithful friend in Jonathan who comforts him when he's at his lowest ebb. You see, David points us to the prophet, the priest, the king, Jesus. Jesus didn't have a home on this earth. This is what he said. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. See, Jesus was also rejected 
by his own people. He said, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. He was also relentlessly pursued by a powerful enemy. Remember that the scribes and the elders of the people, the high priest who was called Caiaphas, um, all plotted to take Jesus and kill him. He had a bunch of dysfunctional people that followed him. You only have to look at the disciples for that. Remember the woman who suffered from bleeding, touching his garment in the crowd, the man with a legion of demons, lepers, paralytics, adulterers, tax collectors, the list goes on. And remember Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. See, Jesus perfectly lived out that. His path was difficult. It was treacherous. Yet he trusted his Father completely and obeyed him, even when the way ahead was desperately bleak. Jesus' prayer in the garden before his betrayal and crucifixion says this, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, the enemies of Jesus manufactured a case against him so that he would be crucified and they'd be rid of him. The scribes, the Pharisees, the crowd of people shouting crucify, the soldiers who beat him, nailed him to the cross, who guarded the tomb, all working to get rid of him, ultimately were stooges in God's master plan. And on the cross, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The question is, where are we in all this? Where are we in this passage? I don't think we're David. I don't think we're Saul. But I think there are four reactions to God in 1 Samuel 23. Firstly, we see the people of Keilah's reaction, this recognition but rejection. Perhaps you've recognised or have experienced the power of God in your life. Perhaps you've prayed in a desperate situation, you've been delivered from that, and you, you can only explain it by God has intervened and the crisis has been averted. But ultimately, you reject him. You just want to go back to how things were. You just want an uneventful, comfortable life. The recognition, but rejection. Perhaps you like the Ziphites. Ziphites was more like an outright rejection. They wanted David out of their way. He's a fellow countryman. He's a faithful servant, a successful warrior. He's the anointed king. No, thank you. Don't want him. You don't want anything to do with him. Perhaps you're like that. You just don't want anything to do with God. And you're just trying to get what you can from life. You perhaps use situations to your own ends to gain favour, to climb the greasy pole. And frankly, God and the thought of God is in the way. So that's outright rejection. Perhaps you're like the men of Saul's army. Perhaps you are conscience stricken but ultimately reject God. Remember in chapter 22 when Saul ordered his soldiers to kill the priests and they refused and Doeg the Edomite does it instead. Where are the armies now? Where, where are, the, are the soldiers now of Saul? Have they gone to David? Have they rejected Saul? I think they're still with Saul. They're chasing after David. You see, they are conscience stricken. They do believe to a degree in God, but they don't trust him. They don't trust in God. You see, Saul had given his soldiers vineyards and fields. They were commanders. They were successful. They were comfortably off. Perhaps that's what kept them on board with Saul. Perhaps that's you. Perhaps you're comfortable and successful. You believe in God, but this comfort and success is keeping you from really trusting in him. There is a fourth way. There is a fourth reaction. And that's the reaction of David's men. The desperate, 
the destitute and those indebted. These people were displaced. They fled to a leader who put his whole trust in the Lord. They don't have it easy, but they are guided by an almighty hand. You see, when we turn and follow Jesus, we realise that of ourselves, we are destitute. And we're in desperate need of him. We're indebted because of our sin. And we need to turn to him for help and follow him. Jesus says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus also says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A famous preacher once said this, the ultimate choice is always the choice of pleasing self and pleasing God. So the question is, what path do you follow? Can you see God's hand, his power in these events in chapter 23, his preservation of David and his followers, his knowledge of the hearts of the people? Remember what God said to David about the Keilahites, his control of the Philistines in the defeat at Keilah and there the raiding of the land at the end of the chapter just at the right time to save David from certain death. That messenger arriving at the right time to Saul, just at the point where uh, Saul and his army were encircling David and his men. Can you see the hand of God in these situations? Are you gonna reject this God? Psalm 27. Uh, is regarded as being written at this particular point in David's life. And the first three verses say this. Now can we say this like David? Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat at my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the picture it shows us of your power, of your hand in things. We thank you that we can see that although we may feel lost in, these, in situations in life, that your hand is there. And if we trust in you, you shall guide us through them, through whatever situation we're in. We pray, Lord, that if we don't know um, or haven't put our trust in you, that we should uh, recognise that. If there are people uh, who are listening, who aren't sure whether they are truly uh, trusting in you, we pray, Lord, that you would help them to see that you are the all-powerful, the omniscient God, and that if they put their trust in you, you shall guide them, and ultimately the end will be glorious. So Lord, we pray now that you would be with us, help us to uh, understand your word more as we consider these things at this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
make everything new. Jesus, one day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away. No more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all. Jesus, one day every question is old. Every anxious thought left behind No more fear When we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory.